I want to talk today about probabilistic data structures and adversarial settings. And this is quite a new line of research for me. Um, and so uh, I don't think I have a completely comprehensive view of the topic, but I thought it would be interesting to share with you some, some recent work that we've been doing in this area um, and talk about the area as a whole as, a, as an exciting and interesting new direction um, for cryptographic research. So let me share with you uh, the agenda for today. I'm going to introduce at a high level probabilistic data structures. I'll probably you've all heard of them before. Um, I'll say a little bit about them in general. Then we're going to have two different foci. So I'm going to talk about Bloom filters and I'm going to talk about something called hyperlog log. I expect that almost all of you have heard of Bloom filters. You may even have used of them. Use them. Um, hyperlog log is much less well known currently, but it deserves to be better known. Um, and uh, it's a very beautiful algorithm for uh, doing cardinality estimation in, in streaming data. Um, and uh, what we're going to look at is the security properties of hyperlog log in some detail. And at the end, um, I'll have some open problems and concluding remarks and maybe try to provide a bit of a research agenda for this area in case some of you are interested in looking for new problems to work on. So what are these probabilistic data structures? So these are something that come up a lot um, in, let's say, undergraduate computer science courses, uh, usually in a course on algorithms and data structures. Uh, so what we're talking about here is designing specific data structures that are efficient um, at handling large data volumes. And we measure efficiency in terms of processing time or the storage required uh, to use those, um, to use those uh, data structures. Um, so um, they're also frequently used to test interview candidates at tech companies. So if you go and have an interview at Google, they might ask you to do something with uh, balancing red, black binary trees or something, right? So that's the kind of thing they use to, to test, to weed out candidates who know computer science from those who don't. But actually more usefully, they're really starting to be very widely used in practice, especially in this era um, of big data. And we need to use them in order to uh, get a handle on the large amounts of data that, that we're dealing with. They're also, as it turns out, a very vibrant area of research in computer science, particularly theoretical computer science. And there's a very wide range of beautiful mathematical techniques being used um, in this area to understand probabilistic data structures, particularly focused on average case performance. Um, and uh, what a lot of algorithms in this area are doing is making some kind of trade-off between perfect correctness um, and efficiency. So for example, uh, the problem of approximate set membership, uh, deciding whether an element is in a set or not, uh, can, be, can be solved using Bloom filters, but Bloom filters have false positives, okay? And you can control the false positive probability and set parameters. And we'll see how to do that later in the talk. Um, okay, so that's the, the landscape. You may say, where are we in theoretical computer science? So I got this from the ACM website. Uh, this is their hierarchy of computer science and you see that it's a subtopic of a subtopic of uh, the theory of computation and we have things like bloom filters and hashing sketching and sampling and so on and this is the kind of uh, area uh, that we are that we're looking at uh, here so a very vibrant branch of, of uh, kind of theoretical computer science as well as something used in practice so um there are also thinking now more about the application side or the deployment side you will find lots of application specific innovations. So you have your basic bloom filter, say, but then people invent variants of bloom filters. There are, there are more than 50 different variants of bloom filters for a specific application domain. So for example, bloom filter cascades were introduced for exact set membership testing. Uh, and we'll talk about, we'll look at bloom filter cascades a little bit later in the talk. So what you see here is there's a kind of a base set of techniques and technologies and ideas, but then there's a lot of variation on top of that that we see. There's a lot of designs to choose from, and there are more of them being invented every year. So you can go and read literature on this. Um, but also there's a theory practice divide, much like we see in cryptography, there's a gap between what people uh, publish in academic papers and what people use in practice. So just one example of this gap, um, the hyperlog log algorithm for approximate cardinality estimation was invented uh, or published in a paper in 2007. The ideas actually go back much further than that in time. Um, and it has a good uh, average case complexity and reasonable storage, but it's not optimal. In 2010, uh, at PODS 2010, uh, Kane et al. published a new algorithm, uh, which here I just refer to as KNW, that solves the same problem and has a much better uh, storage complexity. 
uh, in a complexity theoretic uh, framework using big O notation. Um, on the other hand, the hyperlog log algorithm is extremely simple and you can implement it directly from the paper, whereas the KNW paper um, basically gives you some uh, approximation guarantees and then says, well, just iterate if you want better approximations. So you do parallel repetition of their, of their data structure. Um, and this is probably very mysterious for um, implementers who can't easily go to the paper and just pick up the technique and use it. And this is exactly uh, what we also see in, in cryptography. Another example there, some of the schemes that are used rely on things like KYs independent hash functions, which we also know from cryptography, whereas in practice, people uh, instantiate those hash functions using things like murmur hash, which is like a, a very fast but non-cryptographic hash function. Um, this ubiquity of uh, probabilistic data structures, so their common usage, also implies a potential for abuse. So probabilistic data structures are now being used in what you might call adversarial settings. So they're being used, for example, to track uh, network traffic, to uh, look at uh, where network traffic is coming from, um, but they are only approximate algorithms. And so maybe an adversary who can choose the input that the algorithm sees can fool the probabilistic data structure into making uh, bad decisions or making wrong estimations of uh, set membership or the number of elements in a set, for example. Okay, so um, here, uh, this, this gap between the average case and the worst case uh, analysis or performance analysis can often be used for adversarial advantage. And that's really what I want to explore um, in this talk. So the, the thesis of the talk is that we can, we can look at probabilistic data structures or PDS for short from uh, a cryptographic perspective or using a cryptographic mindset. And we can profit from doing that in terms of finding interesting attacks against PDS, but also uh, protecting them um, against such attacks in adversarial settings. So um, this, uh, this process of, of exploring from a cryptographic mindset involves, first of all, finding out where probabilistic data structures are being used, particularly beyond their original design envelope. So by which I mean in adversarial settings, in settings where there's an adversary who has an interest in uh, fooling the PDS in some way. And um, then, of course, developing attacks, but also building defenses, formally modeling them, and then understanding how to make probabilistic data structures secure. Um, and possibly also inventing completely new probabilistic data structures with a security um, flavor from the beginning, rather than trying to retrofit security on top of probabilistic data structures. So I think there's actually a great opportunity here for cryptographers to uh, look at the literature on PDS and identify places where cryptography can be used from the outset to build better probabilistic data structures that are more robust in a wide range of use cases. In this talk, I'm going to focus, uh, to illustrate this, uh, this thesis, I'm going to focus on two case studies. Uh, the first one uh, on approximate set membership using Bloom filters, and the second one on approximate counting using something called hyperlog log, which I already mentioned. And I'll, I'll introduce hyperlog log in some detail um, if, in the second half of the talk. So we're going to focus on those two application domains, but I want to stress that the kinds of things I'm talking about here are, uh, are, are more widely applicable across probabilistic data structures in general. Okay, so let's, let's uh, talk now about the first of these two case studies. Let's talk about Bloom filters. B Bloom filters solve the following puzzle. Um, I give you a small amount of memory and a large universe of potential inputs, or potential data items. And you want to track which items you have uh, encountered before um, and then test whether a potentially new item has been seen before or not. Okay, um, so um, of course we can build exact solutions to this problem. We could just store an unsorted list of the items and then every time we get a new item, we stick it on the end. Then we have very fast insertion, but very slow lookups. We could store a sorted list of items. Now we can do binary search to do fast lookup, but we still have slow insertion because we have to move everything down to make space for the new item. Um, or then the kind of standard off the shelf solution that people use these days is to use a hash table and then a linked list. So you use a hash table to create, a, use a hash function to create a short fingerprint and use that as the, as the lookup to the beginning of a linked list and then traverse the linked list to find the, the data item that you want to test whether the data item is there, and if not, add it to the end of the linked list. Of course, the problem with all of these solutions is that they consume memory that's linear in the number of items to be tracked. And I said at the outset, you only have a small amount of memory. So these are non-solutions to our problem. 
Um, and so what we have to do is come up with some kind of approximate solution to the, to the, to the problem. And this is where things like bloom filters, also quotient filters and cuckoo filters come into play. So it's interesting here that bloom filters were invented by Bloom in 1970, um, and they really weren't improved upon for a long time. Uh, so I've given a couple of dates here for quotient filters and cuckoo filters. The ideas underlying quotient filters and cuckoo filters actually are, go back a little bit earlier than these two dates. Um, but those are the official introduction dates of these, um, of these new uh, data structures. And I think this also reflects the kind of slow maturing and the slow usefulness of these data structures in, in the kind of large scale data applications that we have today. So these, all, all these uh, objects, all these data structures are training correctness for compactness. They all have false positives, these three that I've listed here, but no false negatives. Okay, so uh, false positive would be that you make a test to see if something is, has been seen before. The data structure, the bloom filter say, says yes, but actually uh, it's a new item that you have not seen before. But they have no false negatives, so they won't tell you that an element is in the set, uh, sorry, that an element is not in the set when it was actually uh, seen before. So they're handling approximate membership queries of, uh, of a particular type. Okay, good. So um, here is a description of, uh, of Bloom Filter, of how Bloom Filters work. So we're going to store an m-bit table uh, and we're going to have k independent hash functions, hi, which map our in input set x uh, onto uh, numbers between zero and m minus one. And these numbers are going to be indices of our, of our table, BF. So these are uh, positions in our table. Um, and then if we want to insert an item into the table, what we do is we compute each of the K hash functions for on, on the same input X. So we compute H I of X for each I between one and K. And then we mark the corresponding entries in the balloon filter. So we uh, start off with an N bit table that contains zero bits and we set those bits to one if the index is hit by h i of x for some i. So for each item that we insert, we're, we're switching k entries in our table from zeros to ones. Okay, and now if we want to test whether an element is in the table or not, what we do is we compute h i of x for each, uh, for each value i, and then we test, uh, and that's what this, uh, this logical and is saying here, we test whether each of the entries in the balloon filter in the appropriate indices h i of x is equal to one. And we output yes, the thing is in the, we, put, we output one if and only if all of the uh, bloom filter indices are set. Okay, is it clear how it operates? I hope so. And of course, what you can immediately see is that as we insert more and more items into the bloom filter, the, uh, we start to get false positives. Okay, and this, these can arise because the predicate here might happen to be true, because of some, because of the bits being set when we inserted other elements y into the balloon filter, and it, clearly, the more elements we insert, the higher chances there are of getting a false positive. So um, we can do um, a, a nice uh, false positive probability uh, calculation for a balloon filter. This is like the standard analysis. Uh, we have these three parameters: m, the number of bits in our table, so that's the the memory that we're consuming; k, the number of hash functions and n, the number of items being inserted. And uh, if everything behaves nicely, so if you make the right randomness assumptions, for example, if you assume that each of your hash functions acts as a, as a random oracle, for example, so that we hit uniformly random uh, entries in the, in, the, uh, in the table, then the false prob positive probability is given by this expression approximately. Uh, so it depends on uh, the three parameters in a, in a fairly complicated way. Um, this is in itself is not very useful, but what you could see is that if you have a target false positive probability, maybe you want a false positive probability of almost one in a hundred, then you could choose the parameters k, n, and n to, to make that true. Um, okay, n here is the number of items being inserted, so maybe you don't have control over that. Maybe you have some a priori uh, bound on the number of items that you're ever going to want to insert into your balloon filter. Um, so uh, here's that probability expression again, and uh, you can actually push the analysis a little bit further and say, well, suppose I have a given target value for n, the number of items I want to insert, and a target value for the false, uh, uh, for the false positive probability epsilon, then you can show that the minimum storage m is reached 
when m divided by n is given by minus 1.44 times log to the base 2 of epsilon. So what you see is that as you decrease epsilon, this uh, expression gets larger. And so you need, for every item you insert, you need uh, a number of more bits to, to handle um, each item that you insert. Of course, this is defined up front. Um, you can't dynamically change the number of bits in your Bloom filter as you go along. Um, that would be a nice thing to be able to do, but I don't think that's easy to do. And also the, the optimal number of hash functions to use, give, to use is given by this expression, minus log to the base two of epsilon. So for example, if you wanted a false um, accept probability of say about one in a thousand, then you would take k equals minus uh, log to the base two of 1000, which is about 10. And then you see that this expression here would be um, about 14 or 15, okay? Because log to the base two of epsilon would be minus 10. And so what that tells you is that the number of bits m you need is about 15 times the number of items that you want to insert. And that might seem like you're not really gaining anything. Now you have 15 times as many, uh, the number of bits you need is 15 times the number of items. But remember the items were arbitrary bit strings that you wanted to, to track, okay? They could be quite long. Um, so what this is saying is like for a false accept probability of 0.1%, uh, you know, you, you, need, you need to, um, make your filter big enough um, that this kind of equality will hold. Okay, good. So, um, uh, and here's a picture to show um, uh, uh, how these parameters are varying with each other. This is taken from Wikipedia. Um, so for example, if we choose uh, to use uh, two to the 28 bits of memory to store our data, uh, then we end up on one of these curves. I think we end up on this purple curve here. So two to the 28 is um, 128 megabits. And you can see that uh, you could store then about 10 to the seven items with a false probability, false accept probability uh, of 10 to the minus eight. Um, and what you see is as the number of items you want to store increases, there comes a point really where the false accept probability runs away. It gets very, very close to one very quite rapidly in this kind of region here, okay? So you really need to know in advance uh, what the maximum N is going to be and then design for that false accept probability. But what I want to stress is this is all in the average case where there's no adversarial behavior whatsoever. We're just assuming that the items are, uh, um, are random and the hash functions behave well in terms of distributing the hash values across the indices of the Bloom filter. Okay, so um, there are lots of places where Bloom filters are, are being used. They're exceptionally widely used in practice. And that actually, this includes uh, a number of adversarial scenarios. Uh, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, efficiency um, of database access. And I'm also gonna talk, I think, about uh, a second application um, to certificate revocation. Um, and talk about some of the security issues that can arise there. So let's talk a little bit about um, efficient database operation and how we would use a balloon filter uh, to help speed up database operations. So what we assume is we have our database, which is huge and stored on a, on a slow disk. And then we have a Bloom filter in fast random access memory, fast RAM. And we're going to use the Bloom filter to filter requests to the database. So a typical request would be something like, uh, is, key, is there an item in the database for key value, key one? So these are not cryptographic keys. These are just database keys. These are bit strings that you use to look up items in the database. You can think of them as record identifiers. So instead of making that query directly to the database, we'll, we'll build a Bloom filter that contains all the keys uh, corresponding to items in the database. And we'll make the query to the Bloom filter first. So the Bloom filter might say, uh, no, uh, key one is not in my Bloom filter which means that there is no record in the database for key one. So we assume that the Bloom filter and the database are synchronized in terms of the keys that they store. Uh, and so we'd reply no. And of course, now what we get here is a fast, correct response because the Bloom filter has no false negatives whatsoever. Okay, no false negatives means that if the key one is not in the Bloom filter, um, it's definitely not in the database. And so we can safely reply with no. There's a second type of query, uh, let's say this time the, the Bloom filter says, yes, key two is in my database. In that case, we would then forward the query to the database. We would get the data item back and then we would forward that to the, uh, to the client requesting the, the lookup in the database. And in this case, the database does contain an item for key two, 
So a disk access is necessary, necessary, and this will be relatively slow, but we have to fetch the data from disk anyway. So the difference here is that in this case where the answer was no, we get a correct answer fast. And when the answer is yes, we get a correct answer rather more slowly. And then there's a third case where we ask for a uh, key three, the Bloom filter says yes, but the database does not actually have uh, a key three entry in it. And so in this case, the, the database would say data item not found, and we would say eventually no to the, uh, to the user making the request. And this corresponds, of course, to a false positive. The Bloom filter has said yes, but the database doesn't actually have um, uh, an entry. And so here, of course, we can make this event occur with low probability on average by tuning the parameters of the Bloom filter. Okay, and so we can then, in a sense, we can protect the, the database on the disk from almost all wrong queries, from almost all queries for which the answer is no, say 99.9% .9 of no queries could be handled by the Bloom filter, and then 0.1% would go through to the database in error and cause a, a lookup on the slow disk. And now I guess it should be obvious that what can happen in an adversarial setting is that if the adversary knows um, all of the entries in the Bloom filter, say, um, then it can make queries uh, which create false positives. So it can create, it could send queries if the, if the adversary is sitting over here acting as a client, then the adversary could make queries that cause the database to make, to do work uh, when the answer is also going to be no, for example. So, um, so the more general question is what kinds of uh, poor performance can we coerce the system into exhibiting? So what can the adversary do? Um, for example, could we tie up the database server via resource exhaustion or denial of service? Um, could, we, could we force it into marking target inputs as being false positives, for example? Um, and this has been studied a little bit in the literature. So there's what, what are called pollution attacks and also coverage attacks against balloon filters, which basically uh, force um, the backend database in this instance to do more work than you would ideally like. What's possible here in terms of attack depends on how we model the adversary and how we model the system. Um, and here's a number of questions that you might ask um, in the process of building uh, a model. Um, so what I want to stress here is that, I mean, this is not an exhaustive list of questions, but it's the kind of things that you would, you would ask. What, does the, what knowledge does the adversary have? What kind of queries can the adversary make? Are there honest users in the system as well as the adversary? Do we have an insertion capability? So what kind of API do we have for, uh, for talking to the, the database? And actually, this is exactly the kind of work that we do when we're building cryptographic security models. So we, we would define a syntax for the class of objects under study. We would then define the adversarial capabilities by giving different oracles enabling access to the system. We would define the, uh, the adversarial objective. What does the adversary want to do? And what's its advantage in, in achieving that objective? This can be a little bit tricky to define here um, compared to cryptographic definitions. Um, and this kind of formal approach for Bloom filters uh, was initiated in this paper from Crypto 2015 by Neor and Yogev. Um, and then at CCS last year, uh, there was a paper by Clayton, Patton, and Shrimpton called uh, Probabilistic Data Structures in Adversarial Environments which um, really developed this area uh, formally uh, in, a, in a broader way for the first time, looking uh, mostly at Bloom filters, but looking at other probabilistic data structures as well. And so they've really uh, put down a very nice foundation for asking and answering these kinds of questions about the behavior of probabilistic data structures in an adversarial environments. So um, I thoroughly recommend reading these two papers, and particularly the last one if you want to get a sort of state-of-the-art snapshot of what's happening in this area. Um, I also then want to move on, having talked a little bit about bloom filters, talk about cascaded bloom filters. And these were introduced in a paper uh, at uh, Oakland 2017 by Larish et al. So um, Larish et al were interested in solving the certificate revocation problem in a private way. And what they did was uh, propose the use of cascaded bloom filters and we'll see exactly what that means in a moment, um, to build compact data structure, a compact data structure for testing certificate revocation status. So basically um, what this data structure does is uh, gives you a test for whether a, a certificate X, uh, or rather uh, whether a particular certificate is in a revoked set 
um, or whether it's non-revoked amongst the set of all possible certificates. So we're going to use X to denote the set of revoked certificates and Y to denote the set of all issued certificates, including the revoked certificates. And what we, what we want to be able to do is build an efficient data structure that enables you to tell whether a particular certificate is in the set X or in the set Y take away X, Y minus X, which is the unrevoked certificates. And the idea is that if you can do this in your browser based on data that maybe you fetch on a regular basis from, uh, from, from the web, um, then you can do private revocation checks. The alternative is that you, um, you need to do uh, online checks like OCSP, Online Certificate Status Protocol, but that leaks information about what certificates you're checking to the CA, to the Certificate Authority. Uh, so it's not particularly uh, privacy respecting. Um, whereas uh, um, this approach enables you to do the check in the browser without going online. Um, this approach of using cascaded bloom filters uh, works in general when the input set X is a static subset of some universe of inputs Y. And it just so happens that in the particular uh, application domain of certificate revocation status checking, um, we can arrange things so that, let's say, we gather all of the certificates uh, from the web or from certificate transparency logs, and we're able to build the sets X and Y a particular moment, at a particular moment in time. So we can kind of satisfy the requirements for this, this system. So here's the core idea of uh, a cascaded bloom filter. Uh, there's a lot more details in the paper by Larry Shadow, but I just wanted to give you the high level idea here. So the first thing that we do is we, we build a bloom filter, BF1 say, to record all of the values X in big X. So remember here, big X is the set of revoked certificates. Okay, so hopefully this is going to be a relatively small data structure, and much smaller than just a list of all of the certificates or a list of all the hash values of certificates. However, depending on how we choose the parameters, this balloon filter is going to have some false positives. So we build a second balloon filter, let's call it BF2, which is catching the false positives uh, for BF1. And here it's crucial that we know uh, the set of the universe, if you like, Y, of all certificates that we might want to, might want to handle. So what we want to catch here are false positives, um, elements in Y that are false positives for balloon filter one. So we can actually compute this. We can take each element in Y and we can test, would it be a false positive for balloon filter one that we just built for the set X? And if so, let's build another balloon filter that records all of those elements y, in, in, in Y. So hopefully this is a, a small subset of Y, depending on how we choose the parameters for the first balloon filter, uh, that will determine the size of this, of this set. And then, of course, uh, the second bloom filter might itself have false positives, so we need to build a third bloom filter to catch the false positives um, arising. And these are elements in X that are false positives for bloom filter two. And so it goes, and you, you iterate this process until you come to some endpoint where the bloom filter is trivial or you have a very small list of certificates left that are false positives for the bloom filter above, and then you would just store a list at the lowest level. Okay, and then the data structure, the cascaded bloom filter, is just the collection of all bloom filters that you produced. And the idea is that if you iterate this, this process to an endpoint, uh, what you're doing really is removing the false positives from the original bloom filter BF1. So in the end, you build a data structure that has no false positives. In other words, you build a perfect membership testing data structure. So something with no false positives and no false negatives. This is the, the idea of their paper. So the questions that would arise then are how many levels do we need and how should we set the bloom filter parameters at each level in order to minimize the total storage required. And also in the Sierra Light paper from Oakland 17, the authors proposed a delta update mechanism. So uh, obviously you have, to you have to distribute this full bloom filter cascade to all of the users that are using your browser at least once um, but then as the ecosystem of certificates changes, as new certificates are issued and old certificates get revoked, um, you need to update the bloom filter cascade. And they proposed a delta update mechanism to do this, where you somehow just send the difference between the old filter and the new filter. But actually, um, in order to minimize the total storage, CRL Lite is setting the parameters such that the false positive rate in each level of the bloom filter cascade is close to one half. Okay, so the, this means that actually um, each of the bloom filters is really quite densely populated. 
And what that means is that the filters are, are, are quite saturated so that a few more um, revocations uh, and or a few more entries into the balloon filters and their po false positive rate will increase rapidly to the point where they really become useless. Okay, so this minimizes storage, but it also means that the cascade is always kind of on the edge of failure, right? It's almost at the point where the false positive rate is so high that it, the, 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 the filter, is, well, individual filters are useless, even if the overall system is still working. And actually this choice, and this is not, this is an observation that we made in our analysis, um, uh, this choice limits the usefulness of Delta updates because um, if only a small number of certificates are updated and that causes you uh, to have to change the parameters of your bloom filters, so to change the values M and K, uh, because N has changed or the set of, of revoke certificates has changed, that means you can't just send a Delta update. You actually have to recompute the entire uh, bloom filter cascade from scratch, from scratch, based on whatever your current view of the sets X and Y is. Um, and so uh, actually what this means is that the, the total cost of running the system is I think higher than the authors originally anticipated because the Delta update mechanism is not going to be useful for very long before you have to do a complete retransmission of the entire bloom filter cascade to all of your users. Um, what we haven't really looked at yet, this is just normal operation. What happens about, say, if you have an adversary who maybe registers some, uh, some websites, some domains, and then revokes them? So what they could do through such an attack is push a popular domain down the cascade, meaning that in order to check the revocation status of that domain, you actually have to do many levels of checking in the bloom filter. So it didn't actually say how you, have to, how you do membership tests in a cascaded bloom filter. But the point is you can, some, you can often stop early if you have resolved the status uh, at, at a higher level in the cascade. But you could take google.com and um, do uh, adversarial registration and revocation in such a way that when you recompute the filter cascade, google.com is the, in the very lowest level in terms of when it gets resolved, when its revocation status gets resolved. resolved. And this would make it expensive to, to check the revocation. There's also the question of what happens um, in such a system, if you have, say, a heartbleed scale revocation event, suppose the number of revoked certificates suddenly went from normal numbers um, and went up by an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude in a, in a short space of time. Um, if you were building a system to, to deploy CRO Lite, then you would need to take care that the system could automatically reconfigure itself and recompute all of the uh, cascade filter characteristics to make sure it could cope with this kind of this kind of event, and this you really want this to happen in an automated way without any uh, human intervention. So um, the sort of long and short here is that, from my perspective, thinking about thinking adversarially about systems like CRLI, we actually need further study, and maybe there are uh, really interesting attacks um, to be found just under the surface here. So we've done some initial study. I worked with uh, Karin Holzhauser, I'm a bachelor student at ETH, and we did an initial analysis together of CRO Lite, um, but um, I think there's more to be done here. There's also the question of provable security. How could you model in a formal way a bloom filter cascade, and how could you prove the security properties of it? And the third question here is actually, well, is a bloom filter cascade the right thing to do? Is it the right probabilistic data structure? So it's an example where a new probabilistic data structure was invented for a specific task by the authors of this paper, actually. They introduced uh, cascaded bloom filters, more or less. They had been proposed a couple of times before, but not really explored in a detailed way. So this paper from Oakland 17 is really the first place where cascaded bloom filters were introduced and analyzed. But maybe if you step back and said, what we really want is a zero false positive membership testing data structure, maybe you wouldn't come up with a cascaded bloom filter as the solution. Maybe you would come up with something else. Um, and so uh, there's actually a really interesting question here for people who study probabilistic data structures. What is the right thing to use in this kind of setting where you want zero false positives? And I forgot to say why we want zero false positives here. It's because we don't want to make a wrong decision about the revocation status of a website. We don't want to say a website is revoked when it's not revoked. Because if it's revoked, then we would deny access to the website or make the user click through, through a bunch of warnings to get to the website. Okay, so uh, further study needed, and I, I hope I've given you there a sense of what kinds of questions one might ask.
No, um, I have about 15 minutes left and I do want to leave some time for Q&A. So let me just give you a little bit of a flavor of the, the next topic. I'll skip, uh, I'm just gonna skip this slide, which is about CRLite and Firefox. Basically, uh, Firefox have experimentally deployed CRLite in their, in, in um, sorry, Mozilla have experimentally de deployed CRLite in Firefox, their browser. Um, and there's a really nice presentation by Tyler van der Merwe at Real World Crypto 2020, which I've referenced here, where you can see all of the engineering challenges that um, Mozilla had to overcome in order to build a system uh, that actually works uh, and deploys CRLite. Um, I, I should emphasize that it exists currently in the nightly and beta versions of Firefox, but not in the main release of Firefox yet. Okay, so um, maybe I'll say just a little bit about Hyperlog Log um, and uh, then leave time for Q&A at the end. So a second puzzle, and um, it's related to the first puzzle, but distinct. Now we, what we want to do is uh, solve the problem of counting the number of distinct elements that we have in some large collection of items, X again, using a small amount of memory. So this is the problem of cardinality estimation. We want to estimate the cardinality of a set. Okay, so this set might contain uh, repeated items and we want to identify how many distinct items we have. So the question is how to do that. Uh, subsidiary questions, how, to do, how do we do that when X is presented in a streaming fashion, meaning that we only see each uh, item once as it goes past, say, on the, on the network. We can't store everything. Uh, we have to uh, update some data structure with information about which items we've seen. And in many applications, approximate counting is good enough. So what if approximate counting is good enough? Can we, can we do something clever? And this is where hyperlog log comes in. This was introduced by uh, Philippe Flagelet et al. in 2007. Um, but actually it was building on a series of papers starting in the, in the 1990s. And hyperlog log is a, uh, the kind of the, the, the final step in their algorithm evolution. Um, and so let me give you the core idea of uh, hyperlog log. So let's suppose we have a hash function that maps elements from our set X that we want to count into n bit strings. So just take your favorite hash function, SHA256, for example. And let's suppose that H has some suitable uniformity property. I won't specify more, but just imagine uh, it behaves uh, like a random oracle, let's see. Okay. So what, let's look at the bits of, a, of H of X for each item X and keep track of the position of the leftmost one bit in uh, the values H of X. And let's call that position M. So here's an example. So we hash the word, we're, we're, our data set happens to contain animals. Uh, to fit on the slide, all the animals are three letter animals. Um, and we have an eight bit hash function here. Uh, so N is eight. And it just so happens that the hash of dog is this bit string, one zero 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 one one zero. And so we look for the leftmost one bit and it's in position one. Here we number our bits from one upwards. So we set M equals one once we've seen hash of dog. And now the next value comes along, it's cat. And the hash of cat happens to begin zero one one. And so now we look in this string and we see that the position, the first position of a one or the leftmost position of a one is in position two. Position two is larger than M equals one. So we update M and now we set M equals to two. So M here is just a variable that's tracking what is the position of the, 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 the rightmost position of the leftmost ones that we've seen in all of the hashes that we've done. Okay, so now we hash Fox. Fox happens to begin with a one, that's in position one. And one is not larger than two. So we keep M equals to two, we don't increment M in this case. And then we have pig and the hash of pig happens to begin with three ones followed by a one. And now we see we have a one in the fourth position. So we update M to four. Okay, so uh, algorithmically, uh, this is very simple. Um, and what we use as our estimate for the cardinality, cardinality at the end of all of this is just two to the M. So uh, our cardinality is estimate is always a power of two and it depends on the position the rightmost position of the leftmost one in all of the hash items that we saw. Um, why, is this an why is this a reasonable estimate for cardinality? Well, the intuition is that um, if we had a random selection of two to the n distinct values x, then we would expect to see a length m string con consisting of n minus one zeros followed by a one, 
as a prefix of one of the h of x's just once. Okay, so if the cardinality is exactly two to the m, we would expect to we would expect to see value m coming out of this process. And then you're kind of inverting that to say, uh, how do we how do we make a cardinality estimate based on the value of m that we observed from the from hashing the data? Of course, this is not a very good estimator, but it does have very low storage. So um, we only need log to the base two m of bit, bits because we're storing the value of m, and we need log to the base two m bits to do that. And so actually, the, to the number of bits you need is doubly logarithmic in the number of items that you're counting. So it's log of log of two to the m, and that's why it's called hyper log log. Okay, the log log here refers to the double logarithm here. So the storage required is very small. This is not a very good estimator, so what we could do is combine many independent estimators to improve uh, the estimate that we get. Um, and um, th uh, the way to do this is to now split the hash function output into a leftmost n bits uh, of h of x to determine which one of many counters to update, and then the rightmost l bits to determine, uh, to de determine the value of the estimator as we did before. So actually, I realize now there's a bit of notational confusion here, I, I apologize for that. I sort of changed notation on you halfway through. And then we use many different estimators like this. So we, we split our hash outputs, we, we update different estimators, and then we take some kind of average across all the different estimators. Okay, and so that actually leads to the hyperloglog -log algorithm. And this is uh, more or less a cut and paste from the original research paper. It's actually from a rewritten version uh, of the original research paper that, that we have written. Um, and uh, this describes the algorithm in full detail. So we have this row function, which tells you, uh, gives you the position of the leftmost one bit. So row of one dot 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 is one, and row of zero, 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 one is four, and so on. Then we have uh, two to the n buckets, uh, where uh, n is a parameter between four and 16. Uh, and this is going to give us, the, this is going to tell us the number of different estimators that we're going to use. And then we have this parameter, which is like a correction uh, factor. And so what we do is for each element x, uh, we hash it to get a value y. We find um, the binary representation um, of the leftmost n bits uh, or the n least significant bits of y. This gives us a, a bucket index. This gives us a counter to update. And then we use the remaining bits, the n plus first bit up to the n plus lth bits. So the last l bits uh, as, our, as our string to compute on. And then we update the bucket value m of j according to uh, the value of rho of w. So this is basically saying find the position of the leftmost one and then we increase the value we store in the bucket if uh, indeed rho of w is larger than the, the previous maximum we saw in this bucket. So this is basically doing two to the n independent cardinality estimates using that simple bit string based approach and then in the end we take a uh, a special kind of averaging. So we have this correction factor alpha m. We multiply it by m squared. So that's the number of buckets squared. And then we use this uh, kind of arithmetic geometric mean of the of the bucket in of the bucket estimates. So we take the inverse of the sum of two to the minus mj. Okay, so this is taking the one over one over the sum of the averages or no, one over the sum of one over the averages. That's what we're doing there. Okay, this gives us a raw estimate for uh, hyperloglog, log And then um, we, we could use that directly, but in the original paper of Flagelli et al, they actually apply some corrections to this. So if the estimate is very small, we actually use a completely different estimator. We switch to using a hit count estimator, which is a different way of estimating estimating the number of objects in a set. And this gives better accuracy at low values, okay? If uh, the total estimate is uh, quite small, so, uh, sorry, small relative to the maximum number of objects we can count, then we use the raw estimate. And if it's larger, then we use a, another modified estimate. And this is to do, to, to correct for collisions that arise in the hyperlog log buckets when the number of items gets large. Um, and what the analysis in Flagelli et al. shows is that this gives you um, a cardinality estimate whose typical relative error is growing as one over the square root of the number of buckets that you're using. So if you use something like um, two to the 16 buckets, 
then the typical relative error is less than 1%. So this gives you a very accurate way of uh, computing cardinalities. Okay, so so much for hyperlog log. Um, it's increasingly used in real world applications, including those where the, the inputs may be adversarially chosen. Okay, so uh, some examples where hyperlog log is used, all really to do with uh, uh, estimating network behavior, but also um, we found a Facebook blog where they talked about using hyperlog log for counting the number of unique Facebook users that are logging into the system. It's also quite widely implemented now in database software. For example, Redis has an implementation of hyperlog log. So um, uh, the long and short of it is that we, we broke hyperlog log in using adversarial input. Uh, and this is a piece of joint work I did with uh, Matilda Reynal, who was a visiting uh, master's student from EPFL. Um, and uh, the reason I have this cartoon here is that actually it wasn't too difficult. Okay, so this is a guy and he's got a gun and he's shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, and so of course you just point the gun into the barrel and you fire and you kill some fish. Um, that's a bit like what breaking hyperlog log uh, was. And I'll just maybe very briefly give you the core idea for the attacks. They do get a little bit, bit more sophisticated than this, but uh, the basic idea throughout is this. So basically, um, if you know the hash function h that's being used, then you, and you can select which values x are going to be inserted into the sketch, then you can basically choose to select, uh, to insert those items, which only begin with a few zero bits. Okay, so uh, when you hash them, um, uh, then you're looking for hash values that begin with mostly with a one or zero one or zero zero one. And the effect of this is to keep all the bucket values small, and then that keeps the estimate small, even though you inserted many items. And it's not hard to analyze this probabilistically. And you can show actually that you can, for example, you can insert exponentially many items into the, into the uh, hyperlog log filter whilst keeping the cardinality estimate constant. So you can make the cardinality estimator think it's only seen uh, a handful of items, maybe M items, where M, M is the total number of buckets, or even just one item, even though you have actually uh, um, inserted uh, say uh, two to the n or two to the two n items into the into the cardinality estimator. Okay, so there are many questions here about uh, modeling this kind of attack, and and in our work, what we do um, in line with what I said before about um, formally modeling this um, is we built formal security models um, with different under different scenarios, and this was based on our own work, but also a couple of very recent papers analyzing hyperlog log. Uh, published in the last year. So building different um, adversarial scenarios and different security models. Um, and uh, we had a lot of fun uh, actually doing mathematical analysis of hyperlog log. Unfortunately, I don't really have time to go through uh, to go through these attacks in detail. Um, but here's, here's a takeaway. Um, for example, in scenario S2, where the attacker only knows the parameters of the hyperlog log, so it knows M and it knows the hash function, you can insert half of all inputs that you, you might generate on average and keep the cardinality estimate to 0 0.693 times M, where M is the number of buckets. If you're prepared to uh, sacrifice a little bit on the insertion rate, then you can insert one over M of all inputs um, and keep the cardinality estimate to one. So in typical applications, M is a, uh, might be something like uh, two to the 12 or two to the 13. So you can, you can expect to insert some reasonable fraction of all the items in the universe, all the bit strings that you might want while still keeping the cardinality estimate to one, okay? So in some sense, hyperlog log is exponentially bad. Okay, so I'm gonna skip uh, quite a lot of slides here. And I just want to say um, that we can actually formally analyze uh, HLL and prove security of a modified version of, hy of hyperlog log. So if instead of using a hash function, we're prepared to use a keyed pseudo random function, so we're now making this uh, hyperlog log algorithm a keyed algorithm, so key needs, k needs to be a secret key here, then actually it's relatively easy to prove that the adversary is effectively reduced to the ideal case where all of the input is just random input. And in that case, it can't actually influence the cardinality estimate at all beyond just random fluctuations. And we built a formal security model 
to enable us to uh, to analyze this and prove uh, theorems in the kind of classical provable security tradition um, for this hyperlog log for this key version of hyperlog log. Okay, and so there, very briefly, is the theorem statement. Uh, you don't need to read that now. The key takeaway is that it is possible to formally analyze and prove security of slightly modified versions of the hyperlog log algorithm and get security. Okay, so um, I really am almost out of time. I apologize for uh, speaking for so long. Um, here are some open problems uh, that I think are interesting to look at. There's really a, an entire um, research agenda here. Most of these I've talked about um, already. Um, so uh, the first four bullet points relate to the treatment of uh, balloon filters and uh, cascaded balloon filters. Um, and the last couple of bullet points are related to hyperlog log. Um, and analyzing variants of hyperlog log and finding further attacks and security proofs for it. So coming to an end, um, probabilistic data structures, really interesting part of theoretical computer science. They're actually very widely used in practice now, much more than maybe one realizes. Uh, and this is due, due to us living in the era of big data. But a lot of those deployments haven't really thought about adversarial inputs. We have, uh, thanks to uh, the work I mentioned from CCS last year, we have the beginnings of a theory of uh, secure probabilistic data structures, but there's a lot still to be done. And actually, if we start with security in mind and build new probabilistic data structures, we might even in, uh, arrive at interesting research um, uh, that would be of interest to the, the theoretical computer science community. And uh, let me just close by uh, saying thanks to uh, my collaborators and my students um, for their help in preparing this talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kenny, for this very interesting keynote. Thanks also for providing this points as to future work. If anyone is interested in pursuing this research direction, here is a research topic that you don't even need to look for questions. Just take it and write papers. Um, any questions? I, I must admit that I've been uh, kind of intuitively teaching students when I was teaching these kind of texts on uh, algorithmic denial of service text, I was mm -hmm. on, on hashing and so on. I was always, always giving it as an example of the use of pseudo random functions. So I was wondering if this, and then you just presented this as a solution for HLL, right? So I wonder if this could, I mean, is there any problem in using it in general, in particular for the uh, Bloom, Bloom, Bloom filters and other applications where we have this problem. So are you saying that one can generally replace a hash function by a PRF and everything will be good? I, I'm just saying that's, that's what I was telling yeah. my students that yeah. I think is, is a thing to do. And I must admit, I've never mm -hmm. you know, really analyzed it. So now you have, right? Or you yeah. have almost, you've done it for HL. Can you generalize it? Yeah, I think I think you can. So in, indeed, the proof for HLL uh, in our paper is like really short. It's very simple. This the 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 reduction that we prove is very very straightforward. So I don't think there's anything particularly complicated here uh, in in the security analysis. I didn't want to give the impression that it was, but I think it's always good to formalize intuition. Um, the question is how much how much more broadly can this be applied? So indeed, in the CCS paper, which was really focused on balloon filters. Uh, Tom Shrimpton and his co-author showed that also using keyed pseudorandom functions there in place of hash functions um, gives you, can, can help you achieve security. Uh, so it also applies in that setting. Um, so perhaps, perhaps it's a universal technique. Um, but to prove that one would need to build like a, a syntax for probabilistic data structures that was broad enough to, to cover everything you might want to prove such a result for. And we currently don't have such a syntax. The, the syntax in, um, in uh, the CCS19 paper is broader than just bloom filters, but it, for example, it don't, I don't think it covers hyperlog log. Um, so we need some kind of development of a broader uh, syntax to capture the kinds of schemes for which this kind of PRF transform would, would work generically. It's a, nice, it's a nice question. This also gives me the opportunity to highlight the really nice open question for hyperlog log which is that hyperlog log using unkeyed hash functions has this very nice emergeability property, which is that if I have two separate uh, hyperlog log data structures, I can merge them together 
uh, for two different sets, X1, X2, I can merge them together and get a cardinality estimate for the union of X1 and X2. And this is just done by taking a max across the pairs of buckets in the, in the two different uh, hyperlog log data structures. If you use a key to the random function and the keys are different in the different uh, hyperlog logs, you can no longer do that. So the question is, how do you get mergeability for a hyperlog log like object uh, with small storage, but that's also secure against adversarial inputs? And I have no idea how to solve that question. I think it probably needs maybe a completely new kind of data structure. And maybe you have to trade uh, off a little bit of uh, storage. You have to use more storage in order to gain uh, security and mergeability. So there's, there, there, are, there are problems um, that actually are introduced by using pseudo random functions. I guess that's what I want to say. You lose certain functionality of some of the data structures. That's cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Kenny, next question from Alastair Beresford. Hi, Alastair. Hi, Kenny. Um, I was really thought-provoking talk. I was just thinking about whether you want a probabilistic data structure at all for this sort of uh, key revocation business. It seems right. to me like we want something that's not probabilistic. And the way that they've constructed it also means that it's no longer fixed in size either. So it sort of seems like we should be looking for a different solution. I, I completely agree with you. And I sort of, I think you've put much more succinctly something I tried to say in my talk, which is that if you were starting with a blank sheet of paper and you wanted to build, you're right, you want a data structure that has zero false positives. So it's not probabilistic anymore. It doesn't give you a probabilistic, probabilistically correct answer. You want something that's definitely correct. Um, so then maybe you wouldn't start with, uh, with bloom filter cascades. Uh, but then I don't know enough about uh, data structures. I'm not enough of a computer scientist uh, to tell you what is the right data structure to use. Um, one of the features here as well is that they were very concerned to minimize total data storage because you have to push this data to every browser on the planet that's using your, um, well, you know, that's using your, the system. So for Mozilla, that's like, I don't know how many hundred million users that is. And you have to push this out once a day so you also need like a gigantic content distribution network. Uh, I think Mozilla got it down to somewhere between one and 10 megabytes that for all of the currently issued certificates on the web, excluding um, uh, Let's Encrypt certificates because they don't have a proper revocation mechanism. Um, so you're getting into some pretty big numbers in terms of uh, data distribution. So I guess the really useful thing about all of this is that if Mozilla have done a test implementation, they actually have now some num concrete numbers. When you're designing a new data structure, you've got a benchmark to aim against. Absolutely. I guess, yeah. And also flesh out some properties you want. Absolutely. And Mozilla have actually written some nice blog posts where you can uh, read, as well as Tyler's presentation, um, you can read their rationale and see some of the design challenges they face. And they actually talk about the scale and, and the, the particular sizes that they encounter. And their code, of course, is also open. So you can go and look and see exactly how, how they chose parameters and so on. So uh, that would be, I think that's a great project for someone to, to try to redesign that from scratch. And, you know, there's an Oakland paper in it, right? For somebody who wants to work on it. So put me in the acknowledgement somewhere if you did. <laughs> great, thanks. Thanks for the question. <laughs>